Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Susie Cohen. I'm the Associate Dean and Professor of Education at Trinity International University. We in invite you tonight to be a part of our webinar on the crisis in education and the call to teach. This crisis in education is extremely important to us because we're personally involved. Some of us may have children or relatives in a K through 12 setting. Other, others of us might be employed in that setting or many of us may have a deep desire um, to be a part of the school system in general. So we urge you to stick around, um, whatever the case may be, as we continue our discussion on teacher shortage and how as a community of believers, we might be able to fill that gap. So as we begin, would you pray with me? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness and your overwhelming love that always surrounds us. We thank you for this time where we get to engage in discussions on pressing issues such as this one. As we think about how this may relate to us personally, Father, we pray that you'll give us clarity of mind and the courage to make a difference in our community. In your name we pray, amen. 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 So today we have a panel. Um, the first person on our panel is Dr. Maria Saunders. Dr. Saunders is the director of our elementary education program. She's a former principal, um, public and private setting, and we're very privileged to have her be a part of this community at Trinity, Florida. The second person on our panel is Dr. Kim Bryan. She's an author, as well as a seasoned instructor in the Florida public school system for over 25 years. She's currently an ESE specialist and she serves as an adjunct professor in their elementary ed department. And then the, th the third person on our panel is Mr. Alex Gisbert. Mr. Gisbert is a principal at Kendall Christian School and has been for the past 10 years or so. And he serves as well as an, as an adjunct professor in our education department. So at this time, what I would like to do is turn this section of the webinar over to Dr. Saunders, who is going to set the context of this webinar. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, there is, today there's 5,000 empty teacher's desks in the state of Florida. And this is a serious issue which I believe the church and the community has to address. Why? Because we need the combined wisdom of our elders to address the teacher shortage. The webinar is multi-purpose. Number one, we need to begin a grassroots dialogue outside of the schools to inform the church and the community that we're in grave danger of our students not having qualified teachers. You may think I'm exaggerating, but wait until you hear the data, wait till you hear the facts. The teacher shortage must be a source of conversation. And this is one of the goals that I want from this. When you leave here, I want you to talk about this. I want you to bring up to friends and families, your coworkers, because we need others to know what's happening in our school systems. Also, this is an opportunity for preschool teachers, Sunday school teachers, before and after school care workers, anyone who has an inclination to want to work with children to step up and become a teacher. Because if you do, you're gonna have a job when you graduate. And number three, to let you know, Trinity's Teachers Training Program is second to none in South Florida. I'm so proud to be as director. And we can train you to become, or we can train anyone to become a fully certified elementary teacher. Okay, now let me give you some facts so you can best understand what is happening in your local schools, public as well as private Christian school. Like we said before, there's 5,000 empty desks. That's how many vacancies for teachers there are in Florida today. In addition to the teacher shortage, there are 4,000 support staff positions that are open. And this includes substitute teachers, security guards, cafeteria workers, janitors, anything. 
Now this data <clears throat> really blew me away. 450,000, I'll repeat that. 450,000 Florida students began the school year last August without a qualified teacher in the classroom. I couldn't believe that one. And of course we know that teachers are leaving the professor, profession at an alarming rate. A National Education Association survey found that 55% of all teachers are contemplating leaving the profession. That's more than half. And the figures are more dire for the Latin communities where 59% want to leave the profession. And among Blacks, teachers, the figure climbs even higher to 62%. The Bureau of Labor Statistic Turnover Survey, and every year the Bureau of Labor does a, a survey on all the industries. This one was done for education. And this one was, again, I, I, I blew my, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it. So the Bureau of Labor Statistic Turnover Service says they found that the ratio of hires to job openings in the education field reached a new low as the 2021-2022 school year came. Now listen to this. There are 0.59 applicants for every position. Not even a whole applicant, 0.59 applicants for every position. This is a, a large decrease from 2010, where there was 1.54 applicants for every position. And even in 2016, it was 1.06 applicants for every position. Furthermore, 80% report that the unfilled job openings have led to more work and obligations for the educators who remain behind. Teachers are saying that they regularly begin their morning their morning by reading emails from school administrators requesting them to fill in for colleagues who are absent. So what does this mean? That they have to give up their planning period, they have to give up their lunch period to ensure that the school keeps running smoothly and that all children are safe. Auxiliary teachers such as music, art, PE, media specialists are usually pulled out to cover the vacancies. And many times when a teacher is absent, the class is split up and the students are farmed out into various classrooms. This situation must become unacceptable. It must stop, especially for our children. The teachers are worn out and the children are losing out. Let me tell about my grandson. I have two grandsons in high school, Jake and Connor. And every day when I, or when I speak to them, they come and say, I spent third period in the cafeteria. I spent second period in the auditorium. I just went to the band room. My math teacher doesn't come in every Friday. Can you imagine a math teacher not coming every Friday? This is the stories that I get from my grandson. So when you think about it, why are, they, why are teachers leaving the profession at such an incredible rate? We know there's various reasons. COVID really did a number on us. Pay scales, overcrowding the classrooms, contract issues, tensions with parents. The bottom line is it's just burnout, burnout, and more burnout. Teachers are feeling isolated compounding discipline problems with students, underpaid, un unfunded resources, simply exhausted with responsibility. They feel that there's a lack of respect and feeling that their job is not considered a profession, but rather a volunteer type of vocation without growth. These are the facts which are hard to believe, but they're real. And so I want to ask both Dr. Bart Bryan and Mr. Gisbert to tell us what's going on in their school. So Dr. Bryan, if you can begin, please. So good evening, everyone. I, you know, the, the, the facts that, that Dr. Saunders spoke about and the data is true data. It's not something, you know, that we pull out of a hat. Um, in the Sun Sentinel earlier on this year for the school year started, they reported that in Broward County, there were 267 vacant teaching positions. Wow. Um, of those vacant teaching positions, um, the school board was only able to fill about 40 something percent of those, but not with qualified teachers, but with substitutes. Um, you know, yes, we want teachers, but I, it's, I think it's important that we have to say we know that teachers don't get paid a lot of money. We know that those things are what they are, but I think it's important that, that teachers have a heart for students. Uh -huh. And so once you have a heart for students and you want to be there, then you, you know, you'll just 
adjust your life and live accordingly to the the small amount of money that you get. You won't drive and you'll drive a little car and, and all of that. But um, I think that's very important that 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 the the, edu the, the the educators that come into education have a heart for education and a heart for students because of the climate that we're in now. Um, when we think about just the practical implications of not having teachers in the classroom, there's a, I mean, we are educators. So we're in a school and our primary purpose is to educate. So there is an impact on learning and the impact on learning because we don't have teachers because they are in the gym and they are in chorus and they are in PE because they don't have a teacher. There are gaps in learning because they might learn a little bit. The department head might be able to get a lesson plan for one day. So we have the gaps. Um, when there is a teacher, they tend to move faster because they have to cover the material. Um, and then oftentimes we find that students are teaching themselves because yeah. when you think about everything that they have to learn. So say in middle school, they're doing the biology end of course exam, which is a high school course, but they're doing it in middle school. The teacher's absent. There are going to be gaps. She's going to have to move faster. And there's a lot of, of, of um, content that the student's going to have to learn at home. And it's a lot. Um, and they don't have a teacher to do that. And the parents are teaching students and parents learn that when we were at the stay at home order. So that's, you know, the immediate impact on not having teachers, the gaps, the fact that we have to move faster and that students are teaching themselves. And you might find that a teacher who might not necessarily be qualified to teach a particular subject is filling in that gap and that causes issues long term. And then there's the, the impact on the consistency of having the same teacher every day, because you know we are on the front line for, for students. So if there is anything going on at home, we see it because we would have that student in our class for 180 days. So if Johnny is coming to school and Johnny doesn't look so good today and Mary doesn't look so well, then we're the ones that notice these things. And because there, we don't have the consistency of the teachers in the classroom, there are things that, that we're missing. Um, you know, there is that impact on the social emotional learning and just that social emotional piece that middle school students have. This is the time that they're, you know, the hormones are raging and the teacher is not there. Who is, you know, as teachers, we are mandatory reporters of um, abuse and things like that. And we're not there. So we're missing these things. And then that burden falls onto the guidance counselors who are now scrambling to do testing. So they're missing that we're missing you know, that emotional piece and that social emotional um, part of who a student is because we're not there consistent, consistently, you know? And so that I think is another impact we have. And there, there's also parent frustration. Parents want to have teacher conferences, but there's no teacher that have the, the teacher conference, uh, you know? Um, what are we gonna do? And when the teacher is there, she's too busy learning, teaching. She doesn't have time for a conference. You know, and how do we tell, how do we as a school tell parents, I'm sorry, Ms. Brown isn't here today, or Ms. Brown, we don't have a, a math teacher, we don't have an algebra teacher. It's, it's hard to say to parents that we don't have that. You know, I'm a proponent for public education and public education is a wonderful thing. Um, but if we're missing a teacher, we're missing a teacher. And so there's a lot of parent frustration, not only for, you know, academics, but just you know, the teachers being in the hallway when there was movement, um, things that we would see, you know, I'm seeing a lot of students, there's a lot of, I think, student apathy because they realize that the teachers aren't there. Um, and so they realize that they are teaching themselves. Um, they are coming to school dressed in all kinds of things. And the reality is we don't have the time to focus on that because we need to make sure that they're getting their, their education. Um, they're spending the time in the gym and they say to themselves, you know, why should I care? The teacher doesn't care. So why, why am I gonna teach you? The teacher's, the teacher's not there, you know? And then for the teachers who are in the building, um, you know, we feel overwhelmed because we are asked, as Dr. Saunders says, to cover classes. Um, 
you know, even though some teachers say, oh, I don't want to cover the class, they offer some type of incentive for, for teachers to cover classes. So you have the geography teacher covering a math class. I, I, and I don't know what they're doing in there, but it is, it's not, it's not math. It's not math, you know? Um, and then it's unfortunate for those of us who are there because we feel overwhelmed with the amount of work that we have to do that is our own. Um, and then if we are ill and we're not at school, that's another absence for those of, of us who are there. And then we feel guilty when we're not there but then we're encouraged and they keep on encouraging us to have self-care and care for ourselves. And, but then if you're sick, you can't come to work. So what do we do? Because we, we, we feel bad because we know that there's a teacher shortage, but then we're sick and we have our own family issues and our own personal issues. So how do we, how do we juggle that? You know, and that's, that's problematic. And I think what is very important is making sure that principles are nice principles. And I know nice is a very overused word, but I think it's important that, that you know, principles understand the importance of being compassionate, compassionate towards those of us who are in the building. Um, we get up, we come every day and we do the best that we can. And so, you know, if, if Ms. Brown is absent today, you're not going to see Ms. Brown in the hallway and say, oh, Ms. Brown, you weren't at work today. You know, let's have that compassion for Ms. Brown. You know, why is Ms. Brown not there? Let's have that compassion. I think it's, you know, and do things for the staff. And it doesn't have to be something that costs a lot of money. Just an acknowledgement. Um, and not only in words, but in deed. You know, you don't want to be standing at the front of the building when Ms. Brown comes in five minutes late to chastise her that she's late. You know, we're just grateful that Ms. Brown is there. Um, the, the impact of this, you know, beyond um, school, but this now impacts the workforce because as the students are in high school, they are missing these things. So how do then are they prepared to join the workforce if they don't have those things? Yes, we might not use Pythagoras, Pythagorean theorem, but we might need to know how to just do some basic, simple, real world math that you learn. Um, in 11th and 12th grade, I think they teach like a personal finance course. And so if there isn't somebody to teach that personal finance course, how are these students getting the skills they need to be productive citizens? Because everybody's not going to college, but they need to get a job. So if the teachers are missing, how do they get the job? And then for those who are going to college, are they learning those note-taking skills? Do they have the time to just fine tune those skills in 11th and 12th grade to prepare them for college? So if the teachers are missing, how are we going to do that? Um, and I think that, you know, most impactful, I think as, as Trinity um, and, and just for, for, for people of faith, it's so important that I see it every day for those of us who believe to be in public education. You know, we can quote Bible scriptures and they don't even know that we're quoting Bible scriptures. And it's almost like a, like a calling for those of us who are Christians, like, oh, she's one, they're one of us. They're one of us. And, and we know, you know, because they say their ways are not our ways. And we're like, oh, that's, they're one of us. So it's important that there are believers and Christians in public education because we have the heart and we have that compassion. You know, we can do things that, you know, non-believers tend not to do because we have that, we, we just, there's a little thing about us Christians that just, I think sets us apart. And I think our goal is for me as an educator, I would like people to see, you know, God in me, you know? And so that is my goal as a Christian to walk forth in this world and for people to see, see who I am. And, and, and I, you know, and I think it's important as educators that people can see the Christianity in us. Um, but not only in word, but in, in deed. And it adds, you know, that, that, that little piece that children need to know that there is somebody who believes in God and who prays. And oftentimes when I talk to parents, I say, listen, this isn't Kim Bryan from Glades Middle School. This is Kim Bryan from Devonwood Avenue. And have you tried prayer? Or have you tried going to church? You know, you can speak to them, you know, on the side and encourage them to, you know, to try things, you know, from a, from a Christian perspective or a biblical perspective, you know, we definitely need to do something. 
Um, and we need to find a way to recruit people into education because you know if we don't get if we don't get educators, then it's it's just going to snowball. It's going to snowball and it's going to snowball and it's going to impact the community. And I don't think that community leaders or people even realize the impact long term that this is going to have on society. Yes. And I don't think they realize the importance of educators and, and what it is that we do, because we do it, most of us do it from our heart because we're not in it for the money. So I just encourage everybody to just whatever you can do to encourage somebody to be a teacher. If you see somebody that looks like they have a little teaching skills, you're like, hey, why don't you try Trinity, you know, or just something, you know, so that we can encourage, so we can make a difference. And it just takes one, just one, you know, it's like that mustard seed, just, just one. And, and we, we can do it. We can do it. Thank you, Thank you for listening. Thank you, um, Dr. Brian. The one thing that really struck me was that what you said, they're teaching themselves. And I come home and I see my grandson. He's got, he's on Khan, Khan Academy. I said, what are you doing? I'm learning math. I don't have a math teacher. So that hit me very hard, what you said. Um, so, you know, Thank you, Kim. Thank you for being out there. Thank you for being the trenches. Alex, now we have Mr. Alex Gisbert. We're going to have another point of view. Mr. Gisbert, like um, Dr. Cohen said, he's principal of um, Kendall Christian. And you're on, Alex. Well, thank you, Dr. Sandra, Saunders. And thank you to all for uh, allowing me to be a part of this. Um, so my perspective will be coming from more of the private sector. This is my 13th year as a school head. Uh, in, in the private sector um, for different schools. Um, and uh, here at Kendall, we are just an elementary school. We have a little over 400 students and 80 employees. Um, we're not in any way immune to, to you know, what's happening out there. It's affecting the independent schools as it's affecting uh, the, the public and the charter schools. So the, the facts are real. Um, what I, you know, what I, the take that I would, um, the approach that I'd like to discuss is more, and, and hopefully speaking to any leaders in the room, uh, and, and leaders as in whether it's a, a future leader that you want to be, even if you're uh, uh, looking into administration or if you're currently leading a school or a division in your school as a department chair. And that's um, really working on retention. Uh, we, we have schools that are going through a lot of turnover. And, and yes, we can discuss uh, employee um, uh, compensation, benefits, uh, but really, it's what can we do to avoid the burnout? Because if you're constantly having to go through that turnaround, it changes your culture and it really just changes your school. So for us, um, and as a school head, we always try for our admin team and, and for us to always think, well, what, what are we doing to care for the teacher um, and, and avoid that burnout and avoid uh, and try to really retain our teachers to, to not get to that that point. Teaching is very different. When I became a teacher many years ago and, and I taught for four years in middle school, I can tell you it's different today than it was uh, 10 years ago and it was five years ago. And I know the anxiety um, that parents can put on, 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 uh, on teachers uh, is, is a lot. I see it day in and day out. Um, and it's very different from, from I, I think, it, the way it was years ago. Um, and as we sometimes, and a lot of that sometimes is we have to also educate the parents. It's almost like uh, I've told parents before, your son needs to learn to tie his shoes before he goes to college. Uh, let's focus on the little things um, and because parents automatically have that anxiety. Well, where are they gonna go to middle school and, and that's gonna affect their high school and so on and so forth. But your child's only four years old. Let's make sure the basics get taken care of first and, and really providing that education to the parents to kind of get to the root of the problem. What is causing the burnout? What is causing the teachers to be stressed? Um, and you don't have to be the school principal to diffuse some of that. You're going to have coworkers that come in and they're going to wear their heart on their sleeve. And it only takes, you know, one teacher to be that, that Debbie Downer to just really just um, always see something negative. But you can be the light in the room and, uh, and, and really just um, explain the benefits of, and, and really the blessing that you're able to, to, to have in that classroom uh, with your students and, and at your school. But um, you know, the challenge that I'll have is really to focus on, yes, as, a, as an independent school, we do our best to make sure that we 
are at or above public school salaries. Um, and that's not, not every school can do that, but it's not all about compensation. I can tell you, if you're a school leader, you know, that is a big part of it, but a lot of it is just employee morale and just making sure that the employees um, want to feel appreciated and supported. Uh, so if you're a department chair or you're a leader at your school, just making sure you listen to your employees. Um, you know, I always tell people, if you want to change the culture, you need to be the culture and, uh, and you need to lead by example. Um, there's so many creative things, and I know Dr. Brian mentioned a few, but um, even just coordinating uh, activities at your school uh, that provide fellowship that really sometimes we'll, we'll just, if there's, we, we have faculty meetings every week on Wednesdays because it's early dismissal, but every now and then, I mean, I just send an email. Uh, it's stuff that can just be sent in an email and uh, letting the employees know, go home early. There's no need for this faculty meeting. You know, we can, and just being spontaneous, but um, the things like that, uh, providing fellowship, the teachers love to, that, that will become your family, uh, whatever the, the school you're either working at or the school you're at. And being able to have uh, time with, with your uh, school family, sometimes even outside of work, um, and, and providing those opportunities just really that provides the community that's what um and that's what i encourage schools to and, and school administrators as well as just even uh, you can be a teacher and still provide that um and, and really try to change the culture but if we focus on retention um we 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 won't have the five thousand empty seats or you know uh we we would really you know again it's it's really trying to work on that family life balance, um, understanding it, and, and many times just listening to the teacher uh, or to the employees of the school. It doesn't always have to be the teacher. We have burnout also in other areas of our school and, um, and making sure that um, the employees feel supported, listened to, um, and also the health of the leader, you know, making sure that the leader is, is taking time to, to, um, to take care of themselves um, and, and, and really dive into to what needs to be taken care of. If not at all, it all comes to pieces. I, I, there's a quote that I love, and it's if the if the principal sneezes, the whole school gets a cold. And um, some of you have probably worked at schools where if the principal's all tense or, or the administration is tense, well, you can feel that tension throughout the entire school. So it's really important that um, that it starts it starts from there. So if there's administrators, it's important to to understand that 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 will resonate through your entire school. Um, so you know it's it's. As I tell my staff, you know, first comes God, then comes family, and then comes work. Um, and if you follow that order, uh, and and your team and, and your environment helps you support that, uh, it, you really avoid the burnout, and you can you can bring people into the family. We we try to always, even when we, we interview individuals, we're not interviewing employees. We're it's people that we're bringing into the family because many times our waking hours are spent more with the people around us at work than it is in our own homes. So, um, so that's my take on it. You know, it's, it's again, schools are going through this. Uh, we, in the past, we used to be inundated with resumes. It's very limited now. Um, and I think a lot of that is, is just individuals not wanting to go into the workforce, uh, into education, knowing how difficult it is to, to deal with everything in addition to all of the, uh, everything that we, we've discussed, um, but but we, we do have a role to play and we do need teachers. Um, and I think we can all make a part in changing the morale and, and, and really making our schools um, as uh, the, the best place to work. Um, and we, we can all play a role in that. It's not just the leader, so. Thank you, Alex. Um, yeah. What really hit me and you're 100% your right, is it begins at the top. It all depends on the attitude of the leader. If the leaders, like you said, is woe is me every day, the school is gonna be woe is me. So um, we've heard the data, we've heard the testimony. And like Alex said, retention. We have to talk about retention and recruitment of teachers. And part of the problem, the retention and recruitment happens in the schools. Alex was just mentioning that, so was Kim. And that is what we're going to concentrate on on the schools, because whatever is happening, whatever good or bad is happening, it's happening in the schools. So if you're a school leader, a teacher, a staff member, a parent with a child in your school, you need to analyze your school from a detached point of view. If you're contemplating becoming a teacher, listen, so you will know what kind of school you want to work in, what kind of school you're going to choose to work in, 
because right now the market is yours. In order to analyze a school, you have to do a lot of unbiased questioning. And the best way I know how to, how to, how to do that is pretend that you're standing on a balcony and you're looking down at the school and you're looking at it from a detached point of view. Don't look at it, this is my baby, this is my family, because that's how we see it. This is my school, how can I improve my school? So this is an open forum. You're going to have the opportunity to share your whatever you think. Um, I want us to learn from each other. Nobody has an answer how to retain teachers, how to recruit teachers. So you need to speak up um, because something you may say may be invaluable to other people. Um, so first of all, let's start. Are there any comments or any discussions uh, for the for the presenters? Anything you want to talk about? Where I mean, any questions for Kim for Alex? Because if not, we're going to get right into it. Okay. So please just unmute your mics and just speak up. Okay. So retention, and we said we're going to concentrate on what's happening in the schools. So what is your school doing to retain your current staff, your teachers, your support personnel? And these are some of the things that successful schools are doing. For example, when you walk into a school or the thing, if you know, if you know anything about your school, does it have a culture of collaboration? Does your school empower the teachers to succeed by providing them with support? And support, I mean, does the administration help with discipline? Are students in special ed and ESOL classes, are they being supported by other personnel than the, just the classroom teacher? Does your school have a mentorship program for beginning teachers? Does your school provide plenty of opportunities to grow as an academic learning community? Besides professional development day, <clears throat> um, one year, we read a book together, how to make a school better. And every, every grade level took a, a, a chapter and we would discuss it throughout the year. Does your school seek teacher feedback? And is that feedback from the teachers and the parents, is that considered when they're making decisions? Um, does your school plan, and something Alex said, you know, we don't wanna burden the teachers all so much. So does, does, your, does the school, plan, intentionally plan a balance between home and school? Uh, is the homework over, does, does the school provide so much homework that it, over, that it bur overburdens the family? Or there's so much extracurricular activities that the teachers are, oh, they're overburdened because they have to attend all these things. So what, let's start with the dialogue. What is your school doing? What do you know that your school is doing to retain teacher, because you don't want to lose what you've got today. What's happening to retain teachers? Alex mentioned a lot because he's a, he's um, he's aware that his teachers will make schools, and if he takes care of the teachers, you know, the teachers won't want to leave. But what happens in your school? What is your school doing? What are you seeing in your child's school? What are you seeing in the school you're working at? That how, what are they doing to retain the employees they have today? So at my school, it's, it's it sounds very simple and basic, but um, we have these nice little, um, those herbal teas that we have in the teacher lounge and they have different kinds. They have stress, cold, allergy, flavored teas, and they restock it. And so they can have tea if they want tea. Um, some weeks, just a, a pot of coffee. So they can come in and just have coffee and it's just there if they want it. Um, and then depending on what's going on, like different departments do different things. Um, they might have, might just cook from home and bring it in. I know in my department, we have a lot of cooking going on and eating. So we're always bringing food from home for breakfast and for lunch. Uh, what different things I food teachers love anything that's free and we love food so if they can come to work and they know that we can get you know a free breakfast 
Um, and tea, the tea is there all the time. So the tea is something that's just there and you just go and you get the hot water and you drink your tea and with whatever it is. But those little things, I think, I think the teachers like little things. It doesn't have to be this big, wonderful gift certificate or gift yeah. card to get a massage or something like that. But the little things that show that you care consistently, not just for that two weeks or that one week we had in May for teacher appreciation week, but just the consistency. Um, my principal also does like a trolley that goes around with um, um, like snacks. Uh, so it could be cookies. And so he has the peer counselors walk and you know, the trolley is coming by and the trolley comes by and you can get cookies, you can get brownies, you can get water just for no reason. The trolley is coming by and make sure you get the trolley and as the trolley missed you, let me know if the trolley missed you. So little things like that. And we enjoy a sweet treat every now and then. So that's what we do. We do. He, my principal is fantastic. So he does a lot of things for us that, that, you know, don't cost a lot of money. But I think teachers want to feel that people care about them. And we like anything that's free too. And it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't have to be much. I used to leave candy bars in the teacher's mailboxes. You know, it wasn't a biggie. And, and not just the teacher, but the staff too, everybody. Little things like that. And like Alex said, he canceled his teacher's meeting today. You know, it's... It's little things that, that make it a family. Alex. I think chocolate is cheaper than therapy and they can come in anytime <laughs> and grab. <laughs> they know they can come in and there's always chocolate in this office somewhere. It's hard for me, but there's always chocolate. And that's, and it's little things, but a lot has to do in, it's been my, my experience with that leader of the school. It all depends what you want as the leader. And if you create a home, away from home, they're not gonna wanna leave you. And they'll understand, I, I'll never forget one time in my school, we had, it was very, the, the economy hit us very hard. We went from 300 students to 150, like in two months, because that was back in 28, 9, 10, where the economy was really bad and people were losing their jobs left and right, they're losing homes. And I had to get my whole staff together and I had to say to them, we got two choices. We can't continue because there's not enough money coming in. Either everybody takes a 15% cut or these pe or 10 people are gonna be let go. I left it up to them because I was heartbroken. I didn't know what to do. And they chose the 15%. We all took a 15% break and I uh, uh, pay cut. And I, made, and I made sure that they knew that I was taking a 15% pay cut also, not just them. But that's because I love my teachers and I appreciated them. And that's, I think there's the key. It does come from the top and it's how we view them, how we appreciate them. And we've got to realize as, as administrators, we don't have schools without the teachers because we can't teach all the classrooms. But I've walked into schools where the principals have been, wow, you know, very hard to please. So that's that that's one thing uh what else let me see what else i got here on my list um, um dr saunders i also was going to say as far as this um environment is like we've all been talking is having a supportive environment and yes. I, i'm not in the school system currently but you know speaking from my previous experiences i've seen a lot of brand new teachers that come into the school system and they're not being supported or and or retained for the following year because they weren't supported during their first year. So I think within that environment, especially for new teachers that we find ways of supporting them through their first year so then they can move into the second year. So from my own experience, what I've seen is just making sure that, that teachers feel irrespective of whatever else is going on, you're supported. We're on your side. Exactly. We've got your back. Exactly. No. Yeah, yeah, to add, that's yeah. To add with what Dr. Cohen is saying, don't wait for your principal to, and for those of you that are going into the field of education, many times the principal is, is, is overwhelmed with so many employees and so much going on, and you may be new to the school, but don't, it's not the sink or swim mentality. Don't wait to sink. It's 
feel free to ask for a mentor, you know, already set those expectations in the beginning and say, you know, I'd like to have a mentor. I'd like to have things because it's not many times it's not intentional. There may not be time for the training and or it may just be kind of a dump of information. The first, you know, they may have you come in before the teacher work days and, and there's only so much you can learn within, you know, a, a two day period. Um, and it, it, it can be overwhelming. Many teachers, unfortunately, after their first year, they leave the field and many times it's just they didn't have that life preserver or they didn't have a, a mentor teacher. Um, so I would speak up if I were, you know, a new teacher, feel comfortable. There's nothing wrong with speaking up and just saying, well, can I have a mentor teacher? Who will that person be? Who can I have that, that I can go to um, and, and, and really get everything I need as information? Schools have their culture. They have their 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 uh, traditions. They have a lot of things that are very that are outside of just the curriculum. Um, and it's really important that you're not feeling alone um, or trying to figure it all out by just reading the employee handbook. No, that that's very true. It has to many times you you're overwhelmed with how much you have to do. People don't realize that when you're the school leader, you have to see everything, not just the classroom. And But one thing is for sure, that schools who don't have mentoring uh, programs for brand new teachers, the teachers will leave because they don't feel supported. And that's one of the things that research showed, that the teachers who stay in a school is because they have a supportive community. And that means they feel valued, they feel um, they're respected. They feel they're supported by the administration. These are the things that they're looking for as um, to, to, to stay in a school. That's, that's what they're looking for. That's the school environment they're looking for. Um, along with, um, with this, with the, the culture of the school, which I believe is the number one reason why people stay in schools. It's the culture, it's gotta be the culture. The other things are okay, but a lot of schools give the same thing. A lot of schools may give incentives, uh, maybe a little bit more money incentive, maybe a day off here or there. But the bottom line, in my experience, when I've walked into the school and the school's falling apart, is because the culture of the school, it's, it's um, you're, you're out for yourself. It's not a collaborative culture. That has been my feelings. Um, what, if you're a teacher, anybody out there, if you can answer this, if you're a teacher, what would make you stay in a school? We've talked about the environment, but there's other things too. I think environment and culture is number one. But what are the things? We all talk about money. Yeah, absolutely, we all want more money. But Dr. But Kim said the same thing. She said, we do it for love because we do. Nobody puts in 50 hours a week for the amount of money we get paid, 50 or 60. So yes, teachers want um, pay increases. I know that, um, they appreciate it. One school up in New Jersey that I visited, this was very interesting. They had, you know, we give, we give our teachers health insurance. Well, some teachers turn it down because their spouse or their significant other have health insurance. What the school, what the principal did, which I thought was really great was, he said, okay, if I'm paying $250 a month per insurance, I'm gonna pay $250 a month towards that teacher's loans, school loans. That was, that was a big seller over there. They said, whoa, I'm married, I don't need the health insurance, but if I go to that school, you know, they're gonna help me pay my students' loans. I thought that was very innovative of the principal. So we're looking at things like that. Um, something else we have to look at, please, anybody who wants to ch chime in, please do so, okay? Dr. Saunders, I, we have a couple of questions coming in. One actually oh, relates, one actually relates to technology. And I thought Alex might be a good one with this since he, teaches some of her technology courses. But the question relates to um, how, how do we navigate technology within the classroom? And sometimes the fact that it disrupts the interaction between the teacher and the student. So in other words, just navigating technology in the classroom itself and any kind of interactions that relates to it. Alex, you want to get you want to feel that one? 
Sure. Um, every school is different. So, I mean, I can yeah. speak on behalf of our school and, and uh, what works for us. Um, tech, technology is, is a tool. It's not the tool, but it is a tool that should be used in the classroom. But nothing replaces the teacher and nothing should replace the teacher. That should really be supplemental. Um, as the grades uh, differ, it, it, you, you obviously see more technology. So at our school, uh, a device, a Surface Pro is given to all fourth and fifth graders. The school provides the Surface Pro because then we control the content. Uh, so that's part of their tuition. They're given that, uh, but it's a school device so that we can put all the parameters in there and, uh, and, and teach um, them how to use it. It's also kind of a preparation for middle school. Um, the, there are supplemental resources there. So the curriculum is all in there, but we also use it as a tool. We still buy all the hardcover textbooks. We're, we're blessed that we're able to do that, invest in the digital books, but also in the hardcover. Because there's times that the students are really learning digital citizenship, and it's so important that that component is taught rather than just giving the device. Um, and for us, it's teaching them that they'll lose that privilege if they misuse it um, or if they try to, you know, find a way to, to get online on a website that they shouldn't or things like that. Um, kids, they're very savvy. They find a way to, to do something or misuse the computer. But uh, for us, it's really teaching that uh, digital citizenship and also making sure that Yes, we, we use it as a supplement, but it's not something we really, there's just, it's so important that we don't just solely rely on technology. We have it, we, you know, we, we benefit from it, but there's days the internet goes out and schools should not just be completely reliant on everything is on their smart board uh, or everything is on, on, on the surface bro when the internet suddenly had an outage. Um, so that's our take as our school. We, we obviously try to navigate because we, we want to make sure our students are also ready. They have to already know how to use their email. They have to do all that when um, they get to middle school. So we have to expose them to it. But again, there's nothing that replaces the teacher and the teacher's role. Um, and using that as a tool, it's just a tool that is used in the classroom. Um, and, and it's just one of the, the many tools that the teacher has in their toolbox. Well, that's one of those tools. Yeah, technology should not replace the teacher. It should enhance the learning. That's, that's the bottom line. If you've got a teacher who's using technology all day long, mm, I would spend more time in that classroom and to see what's really going on. But you know, the, the interactive boards, the smart boards, they're awesome. And they, they can are. be used, they can be they used as, I'm sorry, Dr. Brian? They are, I'm agreeing with you, they are, they are. I think, you know, with technology, I love technology. I think the kids love technology. Um, technology is where everything is at. And I think what happened, I can speak for Broward County, um, when we had to do the stay at home order, we were left floundering because we were used to teacher and student in front with paper in hand. So even though, you know, our school was lucky enough that we had a grant from Verizon. So all of our students had iPads that had internet access from Verizon. So we had access to that. But then we, we have access to Canvas, um, but some teachers were using it and some weren't. So then here we are now at home. And so we were caught training teachers who weren't very familiar with Canvas before. How do we now use this particular learning management system. So I think it's important and, and we can't replace a teacher because it's like at the toll plaza, if those of you have been in Miami for a long time, when you would drive through the airport, there were people in the little floral okay. shirts collecting the toll. Like those people are gone. Like those, all those people lost their jobs. Okay, because now you just scan it. So we don't want teachers to lose their jobs to a computer. Um, so we definitely need somebody to teach, but I do think that it's so important that the teachers can teach the subject, but that they are using some type of um, learning management system. As this, uh, the, the Trinity uses Canvas, it's great, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, students are able to uh, upload their assignments from home, at the, on the football field, in the garage, everywhere they can. Uh, students are, I think sometimes they're even more tech savvy than, than, yes. than we are as adults. I consider myself to be a digital immigrant because you know the computers and AOL and the internet came of age and while I was alive, whereas these children came, were born into the internet. So I have to take my computer or my phone to my children and say, hey, how do you, how do, you do this? 
So I, I think technology, once the teachers are properly trained, so you can have all the technology in the world. And if the teachers aren't properly trained to use the technology and given the opportunity to, to use the technology in real time, practically, before they are forcing students to be able to use it. So give there needs to be some type of, of, of period in which uh, they're, they're able to learn how to use the technology and to use it effectively. And there's so much, there's so much technology out there, different programs, software, all kinds of things. We have to use something that's effective for that particular teacher. So what geography uses might not be what math uses. And you know, those academic software programs are great and fantastic, but they might not be beneficial for special education. So there is no one size fits all exactly. for technology. The key is that technology, yes, is a tool and it should be embraced because this is where we're going. Um, but the teachers also need to be trained effectively how to use it and given time to properly implement it before there is an expectation for the students to be able to use it. Yes? Absolutely, absolutely. I remember when we first got the smart boards in my school. Um, I walked into the classroom and one teacher was just afraid. We had had training, but she wasn't using it. And I walk in and she's using permanent markers on the smart boards. I was gonna die. I, was, I thought I'm gonna kill her. You know, I'm, I'm gonna, she's, this is her last day on earth today. She's gonna meet her maker, you know. It, but it, she was afraid and she felt well, it's like a whiteboard, but you're using permanent markers. Also, you got to remember, this is how students learn today. I mean, like I said, my grandson's learning math by going to Khan Academy. If I was learning math when I was young, I'd take out the book. He finds uh, something on the internet that's going to teach him how to convert decimals to percentages. You know, so we have to embrace it. You know, we can't go away from it, but it cannot be your mainstay. Now, I love Canvas too, because I don't lose any student to work with Canvas. If it's not in my inbox, you didn't turn it in. So Canvas organizes me. So a lot of the, the technology organizes us and children are learning that. You know. So any other questions they have, Dr. Cohen? Yes, there was one other question um, regarding how, uh, I, I know this is a concern of, of Christian um, or Christian community going into public schools. But one of the questions was, how do you, um, how about if you're in a public school system, you have to address topics that you're not really comfortable with? How do you navigate that? And I, I think this, I've taught in both public and private schools and, and it's very interesting. Um, I have, I have different thoughts and my background is also in science, which is, you know, I taught a lot of math and science classes and whoever asked this question, I, I hope you join Trinity and you join one of my science classes because we have these kinds of discussions where we talk about some of these subjects that you have to teach in science that you're just not comfortable with. Um, the good thing is a, a lot of them, you know, are presented as theories, but a lot of times the children themselves, even in public school systems, engage in those conversations and they, they actually debate them together. Um, within private schools, I know a couple of times I, I taught at a Christian school and we pulled out the textbook and there was a whole section that, the, you know, that started out in science, which the kids just kind of looked at it and, and said, oh, this, this doesn't fit what we know and what we're talking about. But I don't know if anybody else on the panel has anything to say well, as also, it relates. It has to be age appropriate. Whatever you want to discuss in the classroom, it has to be age appropriate. Um, in the classrooms, like I know there's the new law now that came out, don't say gay in between K and third. I don't know if a teacher that, that talks about any kind of sexuality between K and third, it's just not appropriate. You know, so I don't think we should shy away from the hard topics, but it's got to be age appropriate. It's got to be the age of the child. You may say, 
you know, let's say a little child comes in, where do babies come from? And he's a second grader. I said, listen, best thing is go home and ask mommy. It depends on the age. Now, if it was a sixth grader, I may sit down and explain it. So a lot of it has to be with age appropriateness. And also, many times, I was a principal of a Christian school for 20 some odd years. I, I call it the Christian bubble. You know, sometimes the children in such a bubble, then they go to, they go to public schools and whoa, their world is blown apart. So I, I, I am for one to look at the appropriateness of the child, appropriateness of the topic, and then I'll decide whether I would discuss it or not. I wish you would have given a better example so we can get a better idea. Because if this is a topic that is really important. Yes, I think for me, um, because I'm in the public school and I, I, I believe that it is um, not my place to judge anybody. Got it. So, um, you know, we have a lot of diverse groups on campus that we are um, allowed to have um, and encouraged to have to encourage everyone to feel um, equal. And so if, if it's, it's about acceptance and accepting everybody as a human, um, regardless of whatever it is that you believe and how you go forth with your life. So this is, this is just acceptance and just, and no judgment. Um, and, and Dr. Saunders is correct as it relates to the age appropriateness of stuff. But in middle school, it, the things that these children say and do, and sometimes you just, you just chuckle and, and walk away. You go, ah, and you just don't say a word. Um, and you know, you can, you know, maybe you should discuss that with your parents. And for the most part, they generally don't, I don't think they're necessary, at least in the middle school, they're not necessarily looking for um, the answer to a question necessarily, because I think they think that they form their own ideas and truths about and facts about what is and what isn't and within their own peer group. But what they look to us for is um, no judgment. Um, this is you know, what it is and this is what you believe. Okay, so what if you're having an issue with it, what, how does that issue make you feel? What, what, is, what, is, what, are the, what are the challenges you're having with this, this view or this idea of what is? Uh, and let us, let us help you process that idea instead of m telling you that, you know, this is what it is and this is what it is. You're just, you'll figure it out at some point, but it is not for us to judge. We just accept that if there's something that's taught in the textbook, this is what the textbook says. This is Ms. Brown's textbook from, I don't know, Pearson. And that's what it is. This is not, you know, Kim Bryan saying that this is what it should be. But I think it's just about have accepting and not judging students because we don't want them to walk away from the interaction with us feeling less than. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And also our jobs are to protect all students, not just the ones that we, we think are, are better than others because we have, we're judgmental, but our job is to protect all students. So um, that's a good question. M Moises, um, uh, good evening, ma'am. Yes. Uh, yes, um, my name is Moses. Hi, everybody. Um, so that's a very, I like that question because you could go a lot of different ways with that question. Um, uh, uh, obviously, you have, I believe there's a little bit more of flexibility if you're in a private school, um, in a public school, um, that, you know, that opens up a big kind of worms. Now, um, in, in, my, in my previous career in the military, you know, I was, you know, at one point I was like, I'm an instructor, but at the same time, I feel like I'm a therapist, <laughs> a counselor, you know, a parent to, to my young Marine, you know? So uh, we have to kind of be, kind of, you know, be careful, you know, cause our primary role, right? Um, I was told, you know, is to teach, right? Well, I was an instructor. So the difference between teacher and instructor, but, um, I will seek, I uh, guess, the culture uh, input. I will seek uh, the principals or the or my direct AP. You know where we stand on this topic. You know whether it's you know examples, right? CRT, uh, gay, um, you know, sexuality kind of questions. You know where does the school stand on those topics and get advice? You know what is my left, my right lateral limits um, before I could you know chime in 
on anything that could be debated in my classroom because you know it does have like like someone stated earlier those conversations do happen in the classroom i have a daughter in middle school and sometimes she brings me stuff for me to hear it i'm like okay really uh, how does that relate to math <laughs> um but you have to listen and process to what they're saying um but uh, i think it all starts with just I guess, you know, being in line with God, right? And and see how much you as a Christian could maybe um, give your, you know, holy input into that debate. And, um, and, and, then, and then, you know, to a certain extent, um, because at the end of the day, I mean, we all should be, uh, you know, we should be you know, busy as it is, right? Teaching, right? Canvas, Pentacle, there's only hours and change in the classroom, we have to get things ready. So, um, but yes, that's a great, interesting topic. And uh, we, I mean, we all need to be prepared how, how to handle that, right? To, to what extent, how detailed do we go into something that is not in our, you know, in our curriculum, right? Um, so that, that would be my input. And you know what too, Moses? I found out that many times the parents are more concerned than the child is. Because your daughter may bring something home and you could say, how could you say that? But to her, it may not be a big deal. She just needs to share it with you. And that's a good thing that she's sharing with you. Because that way you know what's going on. Uh, that's correct. You know, thank you so much. Um, anybody else before we move on? Okay. So uh, let me get my notes. Okay. I want to talk about, think of your school. And I want to call hospitality and education. Hospitality in schools is the same with hospitality in home. So I'm walking up to your school and I look around. Is your school clean? Are the, are the grounds taken care of? Do people greet me? Do they greet each other by name? That's just a cafeteria lady walk by and say, hey, Johnny, how are you doing today? We got pizza, you know, things like that. That's hospitality. Um, do people look like they want to be there? Or you see these really Debbie Downers all the time. Do they welcome others to school? That's some of the things that we, we don't think about hospitality and education, but it's real and it's there. It's part of who we are. And it depends what kind of culture, goes back to the culture, what kind of culture you want in your school. My school was very open. We talk, I mean, we had a homeless person would come by every day in the morning for coffee and we give it to him, you know? Um, of course, the security guard would stand next to the guy. They let him roam around the school. But I mean, so what's your culture? It's an, is your school hospitable? That's another thing you gotta look at that. And like I said, this is something we don't talk about enough as teachers and even in our, school, in our classrooms. I don't think we discuss hospitality in education. So that's something that does the school that you work for. It's a hospitable. When you walk in, the, does the secretary or the reception, does she greet you or she just nods like I've had schools? Yeah, you know. So these are things that, that, that you got to look for in a school. Once again, whether you're a future teacher or a parent like Moses, you're, you're shopping for schools as parents. And you, you have to have an idea when you're shopping for a school what is it that you want? As a teacher, a potential teacher, you're shopping for employment. And remember that today, 0.59 applicants apply for every one position. So if you're teaching in a school where you don't feel value, it's an employee's market. You don't have to stay in that school. Not even one to one, 0.9, per half person to one job. So you also have the ability to say, Right, I like working in that school. It feels hospitable. That's something I was gonna talk about. Anybody wanna bring something up about that? If I can add to that, I think uh, for those that are looking into going into uh, education, one excellent way to do that is as a substitute teacher. Um, there's yes. a way to, to be able to really learn the culture, learn the ropes, um, and really know if that's, if that's really in the direction you, you want to go. Um, but it also lets you, I can, I can't, I, I mean, there's so many substitutes that started, or I should say teachers that started as substitutes 
uh, even at, during my time as, as a leader that have um, worked their way, finished their credentials and are teaching now. Uh, it's just a great way to get your foot into a school and learn the school and, um, and really know that that's what you want to do. That's very true. I'm thinking about how many substitutes became teachers in my school. They got their credentials. In fact, so many of them went through Trinity and they got their credentials and they got a job because I knew them, they knew us, they knew the culture and it just fit, you know? So that's something you gotta look about into school hospitality. So now, and recruitment and, and retention basically go hand in hand, you know? What you've got to think about, if you're looking, if you're a potential teacher, what's going to make you go into a school? You, and, you, and you should have a list of these are the things I want from a school. You can do that now because it, the market is for the employee, okay? So think about the things that you want. Make, make a little list, something. Um, and when we talk about recruitment, and this is something I think that Kim brought it up or Alex, one of you two did, but if you know someone who has the characteristics of a teacher, maybe a Sunday school teacher, a PTA parent, a relative, anyone that you think would make a good teacher, this is the time, this is the moment to encourage them, to mentor them, to support them and becoming a teacher. So think about it. Everybody knows somebody. We're in a, we're in a crisis, folks. And I'm worried about what's going to happen if the trend continues to go down. We have got to start growing teachers. I had a school parent who was a business person and she was fed up with the business world. And she says, I wanna become a teacher. And she'd been substituting for me. And so, you know, I said, well, you know, you can easily become a math teacher. And she went through Trinity. She ended up being my middle school math teacher. So I grew her because I saw the potential in her. And I definitely needed a middle school math teacher. I couldn't find one. And so you have to start identifying people. Hey, let me put a bug in their ear. You know, you could be a good teacher. You know, you've got the qualities. You've got the, the personality for being a compassionate teacher, a caring teacher. Any, any, any discussion on that? Okay. And we can't talk about schools without discussing parents. Parents are a blessing their burden. You know, I used to have a Spanish teacher who would say to me, can we have a school of orphans? Can we just get rid of the parents? And you know, and there's some parents you wanna get rid of, that's no lie. But the bottom line, we know it, the, what we know about is that parents, parents, we know the satisfied parents and steady enrollments leads a school to stability. So how are parents treated in your school? Do you, did the school provide opportunities for parents to volunteer? Are parents empowered to make decisions? Do parents and teachers collaborate? Do parents, this is a biggie, do they recommend your school to other parents? How are parents treated in your school? Are they value? Are they part of the stakeholders? or there's just somebody that just comes in and drops their kids off every day? Do you use the talents that parents have to improve your school? Think about that if you're a parent. Are you asked to volunteer in the school? Do you, you know, do they have, do they have a good work in PTA? And it, it's one that, um, that, that makes a difference. It sees what the school needs and hey, it's, I mean, PTA parents can be amazing. They, they can, you can say, I'll never forget what the, back in the 2000s, we first started getting um, the smart boards in the classroom. I go, okay, PTA, let's see if we can raise money for five smart boards. And they raised money for six, you know? But it was a matter of, hey, parents, coming in to the teacher's lounge. I just bought you coffee. Here's some donuts. Once again, back to the culture. Alex, you have a good PTA? Yes, we're, we're blessed. We have a, a very uh, robust PTA, but, um, but it wasn't always like that. I think it's, it's really important to set those parameters. Um, I, when I started here, I actually had to tell the PTF president if she wanted the job of principal, she could have applied um, because that's, 
that's, you know, that there's sometimes that culture where, well, I'm the PCF president, so I can run the school. Well, you should have applied for the job. Um, and that's not, that's not the norm, but it, it is even for, if you're a teacher or a new teacher uh, or an existing teacher, it's so important to set those, those parameters from day one. Uh, many teachers, unfortunately, they make the mistake of, of just trying to be at the parents' beck and call and text the parents and all that. Um, and, and that can be a double-edged sword. You have to be so careful. And a lot of that really is just kind of going through, sometimes you have to get burned before it gets better. Yeah. Um, and you have to kind of go through those life experiences. Um, but we try our best to train our teachers on, on you, you're welcome to give your cell number. We don't recommend it um, for this reason, A, B, C, D. Um, and we, we also train the parents and we really provide that time where the parents need to know, well, our teachers have their family time. You send an email, it's not, it not be, you know, you're not going to get a response. So we, we try to train our teachers, don't respond to emails when you're at home. Um, because if, if you set that expectation and then every time the parent emails you at eight o'clock, they're going to expect a response before nine. Um, and just things like that. The parents uh, really can be your biggest advocate. Uh, but they can also send you, there's also tactics that you need to know. We did a book study recently called Talk to Me, um, and it was just about that, how to deal with, with communicating with parents. And many times the parent has all this anxiety, and it has nothing to do with the teacher per se, it's just maybe something else going on in their life, and they just pour all that on, on their child and on their teacher. Um, but it's so important to, to really set those parameters and, and work with your co-teachers um, to lift each other up. Uh, I tell my teachers all the time, when you get that dissertation email, any email that is, you know, already you have to kind of scroll up on your phone, that's, that's what we call dissertation emails. Um, don't respond. I tell them, do not respond to those emails. You pick up the phone and you have a conversation because you're going to spend an hour and a half uh, trying to find the right words and it's still not going to be enough. It's going to be misinterpreted. It's going to be misconstrued in a three minute phone call. Um, or a, a small conversation at the door, you're going to be able to, to really just come and, and, and provide that. So those tactics that I feel senior teachers have, um, we have to be intentional in, in really allowing new teachers to understand those, those, uh, those growing pains early, because if not, we're, we're going to burn them out um, because it's, it's real. The, the stress is real. That's very true. Any any comment on parents in school and and being felt and uh, uh, volunteering in schools, being part of the, the school community? One thing that I wanted to ask you guys: th um, Do you do a or uh, do you, the school? Do you do a parent survey, parent teacher student survey? You know, because if if your school does, or you know, fill them out. You know, now it falls back on the principal. What do you do with the survey? You know, I mean, many principals do it because they're expected to do it, but they don't read. They don't read it. That, that information is golden because it's going to tell you so much that you're not aware about. So that's one thing you got to look for. That's my school do, does a survey, but I really want to get to the nitty gritty because sorry, eight fifteen. I want to get to the elephant in the room: the qualified teachers. Remember the data that for every position open, 0.59 people apply. So what does this mean? That we're going to be forced to hire less than qualified teachers. And we all know that poor, quali poor quality teachers and poor quality teaching is going to disrupt learning. And it's gonna have a negative impact on student progression. We also know that qualified teachers lead to a greater learning gains and student progression. So if we hire less than qualified teachers, we need to make a commitment. We need to make a commitment. We need for them to agree that you got to start teacher training within two years because our children deserve better. I know right now you may, we're putting people in the classrooms who shouldn't be there. But the bottom line is we have no choice. But we do have a choice by saying you must get trained. You must get educated. So many times people ask, what's the big deal? Why hire qualified teachers? Oh my gosh, because qualified teachers know how to build relationships. They're positive and caring and they lead to the affirmation of their students. Qualified teachers involve their students in learning in a meaningful way. And they seek to primarily 
uh, motivate the child intrinsically from inside, not just the treasure box at the end of the day. And also qualified teachers believe they're accountable for students learning and growth. They take ownership of student progression, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So we have to talk about the fact that we are going to be, have to put people in the classroom that shouldn't be in the classroom. They don't have the tools. They may have the characteristics of being a teacher. They may feel uh, that they can do this and, and they'll give it everything they've got, but they don't have the tools and our children deserve better. And that's one thing that I wanna encourage school leaders. You hire somebody who's not qualified, they gotta agree that they gotta start their training two years, give them the first year, don't, don't write them. Second year, they gotta start figuring out how to get through college, how to get the education, how to get those tools. So that's something that we gotta remember. Um, I wanna leave you with a few things. So I wanna wrap this up because it's already 8.20. I want you to think about what happens to a community without teachers. And I want you to know why this is so important to me and why this webinar is so important to me and why getting the word out is so important. This is personal to me because when I was four years old, I wanted to be a teacher. I've come from a long line of teachers and I know how much teachers are valued. And I wanted to be part of that group. I love hanging out with teachers. I love teacher talk. I even love the smell of classrooms and classrooms do have a smell. And since I was 16, I wanted to work for God. So God has blessed me with allowing me to be a teacher and working for him. And now he's double blessed me because I'm, I'm in a position that I'm training teachers. So I go, so to me, teachers are everything. So what happens to a community without teachers? What happens is, the students are going to be left without the guidance of, that the teacher provides. They're going to become prey to ignorance. And when this happens, when our populace is ignorant, our democracy is in danger. Why do we need teachers? Because teachers truly are the backbone of this society. A democracy is founded upon an educated populace. A democracy needs for its citizens to be able to think critically. And this is what we do in the classroom. We teach our students to think critically because if we think critically, we'll not be fooled by autocrats, dictators, or tyrants. Because, because of teachers, countries are able to develop socially and economically. You know, I believe that in everything bad that happens in life, there's something called collateral beauty. Collateral new beauty means that something beautiful, something good comes out of a bad situation. And I truly believe that in the midst of this tragic teacher shortage, there are going to be few who are going to stand up and are going to answer the call. I, I take a look at our current students who are in our education program. These women are my heroes. They have full-time jobs. They've got families. They've got they're very involved in their churches. And on top of that, they're going to college to be teachers. I got a lot of hope, but I, we need to find more people like our current students. So some people, when I, now that some people say, well, why do you want to become a teacher? And this is what I say to them. I say, because teacher is a career of possibilities. One day you can be a farmer. The next day you can be a rock star. You could be an astronaut, you could be a counselor, you can be anything you want. Your imagination is your limit. There's never a, 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 a dull day in teaching. Something always comes up. And this I want to leave, I want to leave you with this. Teaching is something sacred. Teaching is not just a job, it's a calling. I had that calling at the age of four. And I answered. I had the calling to accept Christ at the age of eight, and I accepted it. And why is it a calling? Because when you see a child having an aha moment, this is a moment when the child suddenly has a revelation. They've gained new knowledge, a new insight, and new opinions. 
the aha moment is transformational because the child has been changed forever. And that teacher in the classroom, that precious teacher is the agent of transformation. So this is an appeal. We need more teachers. And that's how we're doing this today. Dr. Cohen. Um, Dr. Saunders, just to follow up with what you said, I teaching is so incredibly rewarding. Um, I, I, you can talk to any teacher and they will tell you the same thing. It's, it's one of the most rewarding professions. So I really enjoyed our conversation here tonight. Um, we, we've learned a lot of different things. Um, we know there's a teacher shortage, but more so we know that um, we can step up and be a part of the solution. Um, some of you might be preschool teachers here. You might be a teacher assistant. Um, you might be an aftercare teacher. <laughs> You might be a Sunday school teacher. The funny thing is the first time I realized that I actually wanted to go into teaching is from teaching Sunday school. So if you tonight feel, you know, God's tugging at your heart and you really want to be a teacher, I um, encourage you to take a step of faith um, and complete your degree in education at Trinity International University. Um, You've seen them tonight. We have excellent professors in education, all very skilled in what they do. Um, some of you might think, well, you know, it's not something I can really do now, but the way our classes work is we have five sessions and you finish that course and then another course starts up and you have five sessions, et cetera. Uh, and I had the same kind of thoughts when I, when I started graduate studies, it's, it's how am I gonna do this? I have a family, but we kind of make it a little easier. And one of the greatest things I like about Trinity is the way that we integrate faith and learning. Um, we don't just teach you what it means to be a teacher, but what it means to be a Christian teacher, whether you teach in a private school or a public school. So take a step of faith to help us fill the gap um, in the school system. We wanna say thank you to our panelists, Dr. Brian, Mr. Gisbert, Dr. Saunders. We really appreciate you. And guys, we appreciate you all being here. Thank you for being a part of this, of this webinar. And we pray that God will continue to bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs>